Now, if we have to correlate talk about what is the role of an infectious disease specialist, and right, like you rightly pointed out, Dr. Patna, um, talking about our own context, it's context sitting out of India, uh, it's not a recognized specialty even today in our healthcare ecosystem. Uh, the few infectious disease specialists that we have are the ones who've been trained outside the country, board certified uh, from different nations, who've come back to serve. I'm sure this is the scenario in, in a lot of other parts of the world as well. I'm not talking about the Western world, but just the fact that the burden of these diseases is so huge, which you have established with mentioning those studies and numbers and statistics why is it that uh, one do what is the role of an infectious disease specialist and why it becomes important and why we should not be talking about this only during an epidemic or a pandemic can you please throw some light on that yeah yeah but uh, i think it's an interesting uh, question and that uh, and i think um, you know um, one of the important uh, concepts of uh, infectious diseases training uh, uh, is that you know, we kind of uh, narrow down our infectious diseases, uh, uh, you know, training and um, uh, practice confined to hospitals. And I think that has actually emerged from primarily from a US based uh, model of care where they trained, where they still train infectious disease specialists and they cater to a lot of hospital acquired infections in the US. And that's uh, predominant form of training model which is being followed in uh, most parts of the country including uh, in Australia and then also in uh, UK but uh, the role of an infectious disease specialist not just lies within the confines of the hospital it actually you know spreads out into the public or population health aspects and um, and uh, we could uh, very well quote the example of COVID-19 or coronavirus situation on how the role of infectious disease specialists could very well be, um, uh, you know, uh, utilized. For example, uh, we have now, uh, you know, we it is important for us to engage a trained infectious disease specialist in um, containing the spread of uh, infection in the population. And as you can see, that there are several stages of spreading of infection into the community. Uh, in like yeah. in in uh, several countries where they have implemented travel ban, and that's usually the first stage of containment. The second stage is uh, you know containing uh, the community level transmission, and then uh, third is to uh, third stage is to contain the uh, surge of epidemic uh, um, epidemics in within the local um, population, and then the fourth is to make that epidemic into an endemic um, uh, endemic situation. And if you look at this, you know, it, it sounds very simple, but it's not as simple as what I just said. It requires a scientific uh, approach and it requires uh, a combination of um, infectious diseases, uh, specialists coordinating with the nurses, with the public health officials, with the government officials, with the law enforcement agencies. So you can see that the, the scope of infectious diseases is not just limited to the hospitals, wherein you know isolation and treatment happens, but it also spreads beyond uh, the public and it spreads all the way up to the law enforcement and the government uh, government uh, agencies. So it is a very uh, interesting field and one uh, area where uh, your impact could be felt beyond the walls of the hospitals and um, you know people who want to make a bigger change in healthcare, uh, you know, I, I would uh, definitely recommend infectious diseases, one of the areas where um, this will be a, a big, uh, a big change for uh, healthcare professionals. And I think with given all the uh, gap in training and in the need of the hour of several trained infectious disease specialists, um, I think a lot of people would uh, benefit from the courses uh, such, such as the one offered by adversity right uh, let me pick up a question um dr padma yep. um there is a, a for the benefit of the audience i will try and pick up questions during the conversation but if any of your questions are left out we will make sure we'll address them towards the end of the session let me just pick up a, a question here uh, there is somebody uh, joe riz hi uh Jodas is asking can i ask corona is constantly developing and mutating into different strains for over a decade 
how come after every epidemic they halt all the studies <laughs> why is the panic only during the panic sure very good question jo i think we'll have to deviate from our topic but i'll answer your question in a nutshell um i want to take you back to the sars um, episode uh you know sars through a big uh issue in hong kong and the hong kong government actually literally had to lock down the entire uh, country and uh, you know but um the we were all scared and it started spreading to different parts of the uh, world but uh, luckily we they contained it and uh, what happened was that during that time they pumped in a lot of money into research and training and uh, after a while the funding stopped and therefore the research stops and once the research stops there is no new knowledge about the biomarkers which is actually directly linked to vaccine development or treatment development so once uh, the funding stops there is no uh, research happening in those areas and therefore that that therefore that is the main reason why you don't get any um uh medications or cure or vaccines for that the same thing happened with mers coronavirus and again we have seen another form of coronavirus which is covid-19 and uh, you could your question is valid why didn't we have it before because you know governments think that you know funding for 6 months a year and then stopping the epidemic is good enough and after that the funding stops the researchers also have to move on because if they don't get funded their salaries are uh, not funded and you know they they stay a bread and butter so they also move to different topics so it's definitely the question of funding if there is sustained funding there will be a uh, cure uh, there will be new newer diagnostics newer vaccines newer therapeutics available for each of this and it also depends on um the market viability and also the intent for pharmaceutical companies to invest in research and uh, uh, development and i think that is also a major issue if it affects you know one country with a little population they would definitely not be inclined but it's something which is seasonal which is going to come up regularly then they will uh, invest because of the viability of the market viability so there are multiple uh, facets to your answer there's no one one particular answer there's multiple angles to it so it in it is a, it's a combination of things it's not just one thing right i think uh, but the point is valid and all of us are asking the same question why is it that we end up asking these questions only when we are in the middle of a situation like this that's unfortunate <laughs>